Well, hello and welcome back, Organic Chem students. It's your old pal, Kim Tano, uh, with another video in our Organic Chem series. This video is going to talk about hybridization basics. And uh, if remember, you, if you like these videos, go ahead and hit like and uh, subscribe to my channel. You'll always be the first to know when a new video comes out. So hybridization. Um, in order to talk about hybridization, I, this video presupposes that you know a little bit about atomic orbital theory, meaning that you understand a little bit about electron configurations, orbital filling diagrams, atomic orbital shapes, and whatnot. Um, so if that's the case, then uh, party on. If not, look on the channel and uh, maybe catch up a little bit. So we're going to take a look at carbon, since organic chemistry is about carbon, and, and specifically carbon's atomic orbitals. You remember it's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, which means that in its orbital filling diagram, you have a pair in the 1s. Those are core electrons. We don't really care about them. You have a pair in the 2s and then two electrons in separate p orbitals. Now, looking at that, that suggests that carbon is going to want to form two bonds to pair up those two unpaired electrons. And if it forms two single bonds, that those bonds should have a bond angle of about 90 degrees. Well, why 90 degrees? Well, if the p orbitals are where those unpaired electrons are. And the p orbitals, you'll remember, are along the principal axes in three dimensions, x, y, and z. That means any two p orbitals will be perpendicular to one another. And so the bond angles that form should be 90 degrees. Well, as it turns out, uh, we don't see that in nature. We don't observe that particular behavior with carbon. Uh, if you do x-ray crystallography on carbon containing compounds, uh, you see that carbon sometimes forms two, as we would expect, sometimes three and sometimes four bonds, and none of the bond angles are 90 degrees, which is kind of weird based on what we just talked about. Mostly, you're either going to get linear if it's two bonds, trigonal planar, which is 120 degree bond angle, if it's three bonds, and if four bonds, you get a tetrahedral conformation, which is 109.5 degrees. So the big question is, you know, what the heck is going on? We've got these three different, very different shapes with carbon, and carbon clearly forming more than two bonds, which is what we're expecting. So, so what's going on here? Well, it turns out that carbon, when it bonds, mixes its valence orbitals. So it mixes its 2s and 2p orbitals to form four degenerate, same energy, hybridized orbitals. If it mixes all four of these, the one of one s orbital and three p orbitals, you get four degenerate, what we call sp3 hybrid orbitals. The sp3 simply means that it's made of an s orbital and three p orbitals. The four electrons that were in those orbitals are now redistributed, one in each according to Hund's rule. And you now have four unpaired electrons for carbon to form four bonds. Now that's not the only way that carbon can do this, okay? But it is certainly one of the more common ways. So you can kind of see geometrically speaking, uh, this S orbital and then the three perpendicular P orbitals, uh, when they hybridize, they make this tetrahedral shape. Uh, they combine and, uh, and end up pointing at 109 and a half degrees away from one another. This is uh, a picture of what those sp3 orbitals might look like. Okay, and remember, orbitals are simply just uh, graphed versions of the Schrodinger's wave equation for particular electrons in those areas. So um, they're clouds essentially where the electrons are likely to be found. So we've got these 109 and a half. Uh, tetrahedral angles in here when we have sp3. And that's why carbon, when it forms four single bonds, can form a tetrahedron. Now, that's not the only way that carbon can do this. Carbon can also mix its s and two of the p orbitals, leaving one of them unmixed, unhybridized. So since we mixed an s and two of the p's, we call these sp2 hybridized orbitals. And we have an unhybridized p orbital that still has an electron in it, but it's not been mixed. And it's still at the same energy of the other p orbitals that it, was, that it had before. You'll notice that the energy of the hybridized orbital is somewhere in between the energy of the s and p. It's closer to the p because there's more p orbitals mixed in. 
Well, what happens now if we have three hybrid orbitals and then this unhybridized p orbital? What does that do? Well, the three hybrid orbitals can mix together to form a trigonal planar orientation, 120 degrees. And the one p orbital that's left over is perpendicular to that plane. They all lie in a plane, 120 degrees. And the p orbital is sticking out above and below that plane, unhybridized. It's perpendicular to that. Okay, so these are the sp2 hybridized orbitals, and then p orbital would be coming right out of your screen at you, facing you right here and behind. And that unhybridized p orbital is going to allow us for some rather interesting bonding that we'll see in just a second. Now, there's another way that carbon can do this as well. It can take one of its s orbitals and only one of its p orbitals and mix them together to make an sp, this should say sp, hybridized. That leaves two unhybridized p orbitals that are perpendicular to one another. The, what the shape looks like is essentially two hybridized orbitals that end up being 180 degrees from one another. And then the p orbitals would be along the y and z axis, perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to this set of hybrid orbitals. And so that leads to even more interesting bonding that we'll talk about right now. So when they bond, there's a couple things about bonding. In order for two atoms to bond, they have to overlap their bonding orbitals, okay? So the orbitals in their valence shell where the, the unpaired electrons live, uh, in order to pair up, those orbitals, those clouds have to overlap with one another. If you have them overlapping head to head, meaning they face each other and they just come straight overlap, you form what's called a sigma bond. If they overlap side to side, so p orbitals will do this, unhybridized p orbitals will overlap side to side you get a, what's called a pi bond okay you always have to have a sigma bond between two atoms in order for them to bond and only one sigma bond will ever form between two atoms okay you can have one or two pi bonds in additional uh, in addition to those sigma bonds between the two atoms but you have to have a sigma bond okay if you have a multiple bond like a double or triple bond they're always composed of one sigma bond and then the rest are pi bonds okay so here's methane okay so we've got carbon with its hybridized sp3 orbitals here hydrogen only has the one electron in the one orbital so it doesn't mix it doesn't hybridize it just overlaps here to form a sigma bond a sigma bond a sigma bond and a sigma bond that's head-to-head -head overlap right in ethylene which is carbon with a double bond in between two carbons and then two hydrogens. You can see the hydrogens are forming sigma bonds by overlapping with these two hybrid orbitals. These two hybrid orbitals between the two carbons are forming a sigma bond. And then you've got the green p orbitals, which are kind of parallel to one another, and they overlap side to side. And that creates what's called a pi bond. And the pi bond is what makes this a double bond. I know it looks like a triple bond because there's a green and then blue and then green again. But this green business is all just one pi bond because it's one pair of p orbitals that are sharing. And this is one sigma bond because it's one pair of sp3 orbital or sp2 orbitals that are shared. So this is a double bond in ethylene. Okay, uh, in acetylene, acetylene is C2H2 with two carbons are joined by triple bonds. You have two pi bonds. There's your sigma. These yellow bonds are our hybrid orbitals, sp hybridized orbitals, and they're 180 degrees apart from each other. And then the red and blue are the unhybridized p orbitals, and they overlap in a side to side fashion, creating this like cloud area around the internuclear axis. And this cloud area is the, the two pi bonds that make the triple bond between acetylene. So not just carbon hybridizes. Uh, most nonmetals, when they bond covalently, will hybridize. And you can see this in this molecule. This is CO2. The carbon has, here's a hybrid, here's a hybrid. So what is the hybridization of this carbon if it only has two hybrid orbitals and two unhybridized p orbitals represented by the blue? Well, this would be sp hybrid, right? sp hybridization. So these are overlapped with these green orbitals from oxygen. Well, look at this. We've got three hybrid orbitals on the oxygen in a plane, and then we have this unhybridized p orbital. So oxygen here is hybridized as sp2. And that allows this unhybridized p orbital to overlap 
side to side overlap with one of the p orbitals on the carbon to create a pi bond there. And the same thing happens over here. We get a pi bond over here. So the two double bonds in CO2, one double bond on this side, sigma and pi, sigma and pi, are formed from those atomic orbitals overlapping. Okay? So that's the basics of hybridization and how carbon can form these multiple bonding situations um, with other elements or as well as with itself. Uh, make sure you take good notes if you need it. And... Uh, Make sure you get some practice in identifying hybridization. And we'll see you next time.